Join me in prayer. God of all power, wisdom, and mercy, give us hearts willing to be opened even at the cost of our comfort. Give us all that we need and teach us that all we need is your love in this moment. Remind us that we have that love. There is nothing else we need. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Paul was not having a good time in ministry with these Corinthians. Somewhere along the way, this church had fallen in love with a flashier apostle, a super apostle. Paul had come to them with his scholarly robe, his tent-making tools, his deep thoughts, and his constant urging to be better humans. And when he left, some young guy with a family and a guitar, wearing jeans and a cute button-up top, came along and mesmerized the congregation. The young guy was going to bring in new families and grow their church. His beautiful young wife was going to lead the praise band, and you know, his easygoing, very traditional teaching, dressed up in fashionable shoes and pop culture sound bites, was going to make them popular. And they would choose not to worry about the allegations of sexual misconduct that followed them in whispers from city to city. They won't think too much about their really nice chariot and designer label clothes. In fact, the Corinthians just wouldn't think too much at all. They'll sit back and bask in their popularity. The message of Christ, the cool young pastor tells us, is that our lives should be pleasant, that we should have wine at every meal, that those who have plenty should hoard more for themselves, and those who have none, should figure out how to pull themselves up by their bootstraps. That's what the super apostles say. That's what the megachurch pastors say. And the haters gonna hate, hate, hate. Paul, with his bent over body and his tent maker's robes, his knees all knobby and his beard all scraggly, writes those Corinthians this letter as he prepares to return to visit them. Those super apostles have been talking about Paul behind his back, whispering like that old serpent in the garden, that Paul has lingered elsewhere because really he prefers the Romans to the Corinthians. Whispering that all the pain and deprivation Paul describes is just nonsense. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? Surely God wants to prosper God's people, right? And I have to get on board with Paul as he rings out a resounding no. No, that is not what following Christ means. It's not how it works. If they hated the shepherd, how much more are they going to hate the sheep? That isn't popularity. Something about following Christ puts us at odds with our society. Something about following Christ makes us see that life isn't about accumulating the most and the best stuff. We look to our scriptures and we see our Savior and see our Savior being lied about. We see our Savior being beaten like our common criminal, we see him being executed, maybe like one of those serial killers on death row. This is the gospel, that even though Christ did no wrong, he suffered and died under the hands of Pontius Pilate, his own people turned against him, both the Jewish religious elite and those Jewish folks who were his first disciples. They deserted him because it was not cool to be crucified. Crucifixion was a curse, not a sign of power or a guarantee of a life of ease. It was defeat, total humiliating 
defeat. Paul was not being extra when he listed all those hardships he faced. He wasn't trying to build a social media following by manipulating people's emotions. He had literally endured beatings and great afflictions. He had continued his work in the midst of hardships you and I cannot imagine. He knew sleepless nights, wondering if all of this work he was doing meant anything or if it was all just vanity. The preacher of Ecclesiastes said it was all vanity, all chasing after wind. Paul knew the pain of hunger, of sitting with the poor and not eating, relying on God's gracious sustenance. And if you've ever had to wait on God to decide to answer your prayer, you know that it can take days or weeks. God isn't Uber Eats or DoorDash. God is God. And sometimes God says no. Sometimes God says wait. <laughs> and every once in a while, God delivers in 30 minutes or less. God loves us so much. And God also leaves us unread for days. And it's in those times when God is quiet that we have to act in purity, speak in knowledge and truth. It is in those times more than any other that we must cultivate a holiness of spirit and care for one another with genuine love. This week has been a rough one. The two congregations have both had leadership meetings. <laughs> we have looked at money. We have looked at the people who are available to help with this work we're doing. We have seen how many of you have given faithfully of your time and your talent and your treasures. We have rejoiced at your willingness to share your life and your love with the churches, serving Jesus with your whole selves. And like Paul speaking frankly to the Corinthians, I stand here to speak frank frankly to you. Without God, we are nothing. Without Jesus, we do not have enough bread to feed those who are here, much less those who are perishing without knowing about grace. Without the Spirit, we don't even know how to breathe. Paul calls us to open our hearts, open them wide to the love of God found in Christ Jesus. Open our hearts, expose them the way a beloved pet rolls over to expose their belly. Open ourselves to the potential to be hurt. Because it is only in opening our hearts to one another that we can build a community of believers. It's only in open communication that we can tear down the walls that divide us. And beloved, there are still walls here. We're still suspicious of one another. <laughs> We're still annoyed by our sibling in Christ. We still refuse to acknowledge that there are differences of opinions, thinking that if we just say nothing, those differences will disappear. They will not. If we want to be a true, beloved community, we must open our hearts and bear in them courage to speak our truth and in turn hear the truths of the others. We all exist in systems, family systems, church systems, work systems. We both desperately need one another and need to be differentiated. We need to be holy ourselves and holy one of a communion. This is the dualism that we try to contain that threatens to drive us mad almost as much as the idea that we are living in the now and not yet time of God's reign. The kingdom of heaven is near. 
and it is here, <laughs> and it's a million years away. So we will focus on doing all the good we can by all the means we have every time we can. We pray for God to open our hearts to see the blessedness of each person we meet. We work to share our truth and speak in the same mercy that we hope to receive. And we work to tell others why this thing we call church is so much more than a country club or a social gathering. This thing called church is the very body of Christ. We are Jesus' hands, feet, and voices in the world. None of us is going to do this perfectly all the time. At best, we will sometimes do the right thing at the right time. And that's okay. It truly is. As long as our hearts are open, there is hope. As long as we breathe, we can change. As long as we have each other, we have the Spirit of God in our midst. And it is for this that we can say, Thanks be to God.